Hi everybody, my name is Frank Reagan. I am chairperson of the Rochester Regional Group of the Sierra Club's Climate Change Committee. I'm also chief cook and bottle washer at the blog rochesterenvironment.com that I have hosted for over 20 years. Over the years, my daily focus on our local environment has morphed into concerns about the worldwide crisis of climate change and its local impact. Today, I am reviewing the nonfiction book, The Uninhabitable Earth, Life After Warming, by David Wallace Wells. Here's the, what it looks like. This book was a New York Times bestseller and was copyrighted in 2019. Before I talk about the book itself, I want to introduce David Wallace Wells, who is deputy editor and climate columnist for a New York magazine, not the New York Times. Wells admit, I am not an environmentalist. I don't even think of myself as a nature person. On July 10th, 2017, Wells wrote an article in New York Magazine called The Uninhabitable Earth, Famine, Economic Collapse, A Sun That Cooks Us, What Climate Change Could Wreak Sooner Than You Think. The article, according to Wells, was the most read article in the history of the magazine. The article generated a lot of interest as well as shrieks from critics that he made it all up. In response, Wells quickly put up an online annotated version of the article that referenced just about every one of his sentences from climate experts and other authorities. This book, The Uninhabitable Earth, is, has 65 pages of notes in a work that is only 299 pages long. The known unknowns, as Donald Rumfeld would say. It's worse, much worse than you think, Wells starts his book. And from there, the book describes a hellish world we are quickly moving into, especially if humanity does not understand the full implications of this worldwide crisis and fails to seriously address them. I like Wells' approach in the book. It's the inquiry of an intelligent and articulate person willing to take the time to fully understand the climate crisis. He doesn't have an environmental ax to grind. He wants to find out if all the alarmist articles he's been reading and collecting over the years about climate change have any merit. He found to his alarm that they do. His journey has led him to realize that much of the general public's understanding of climate change is a collection of myths, that it's not happening, or if it is, it's happening far away, it's a kind of a natural disaster, not ours, that we can spend ourselves out of this mess, that if fuel, fossil fuels got us into this plight, they will get us out. And because we've had climate changes before, this one isn't a big deal. Well, it says, I am like every other American who has spent their life fatally complacent and willingly deluded about climate change, which is not just the biggest threat human life on the planet has ever faced, but a threat of an entirely different category and scale. That is the scale of human life itself. Warming. Well says, this is not a book about the science of warming. It's about what warming means to the way we live on this planet. Our planet's temperature is going up, and at various degrees we can expect not only discomfort and suffering, but after a certain point, life itself will be unsurvivable. Wells catalogs the projected scenarios for various temperature increases and what each would impose on our way of life. He mentions what is increasingly being heralded by climate scientists as a limit to the heat humans can withstand. For example, besides watching the CO2 levels, which will determine whether humanity as a whole can survive, this quickly warming world, on a more personal level, we must be wary of the wet bulb temperature. Well, it says, with direct heat, the key factor is something called wet bulb temperature, which also measures humidity in a combined method as home laboratory kit as it sounds. The temperature is registered on a thermometer wrapped in a damp sock as it is swung around in the air. At present, most regions reach a wet bulb maximum of 26 or 27 degrees Celsius, the true red line for ability is 35 degrees, beyond which humans begin simply dying from the heat. By the way, 35C is 95 Fahrenheit. Working outside in some places of the world that reach this limit will be impossible. Hunger. Because of the, cat, the drastic changes in our climate, our ability to get enough food for everyone will be more problematic as the temperatures rise. Many of the staples humanity survives on, like grain, will be harder to grow in regions that will be hit with droughts, temperature increases, and floods sooner than, sooner than others. 
Well says, overall, the United Nations estimates that the planet will need nearly twice as much food in 2050 as it does today. And although this is a speculative figure, it's not a bad one. Drowning. Sea level rise is already baked into many of the climate scenarios because we have already allowed too much greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere. More heat causes water to expand, which is already occurring, but most of the water rising will come from melting glaciers of Greenland and Antarctica, which means many of our coastline communities are going to get inundated by water already, and they must prepare or move. Well says, climate change may not only make the miles along the American coast uninsurable, it could render obsolete the very idea of disaster insurance. By the end of the century, one recent study showed certain places could be struck by six different climate-driven disasters simultaneously. Wildfires. We have already witnessed many dramatic increases of wildfire on us wildfires in Australia, California, and even the Arctic forest because of climate change. More wildfires burn more trees and brush, and because there will be more precipitation, because warmer air holds more water, there will be more brushes and shrubs kindling and droughts, which will dry out the bushes and shrubs and make wildfires larger and hotter. There is already, and there will be more massive increases in infestation of our forests because of invasive species can now last through our warmer winters, making for more wildfire kindling. Well says, what this means is that at three degrees of warming, our likely benchmark for the end of the century, the United States might be dealing with 16 times more devastation from fire as we are today, when a single year, 10 million acres were burned. Disasters are no longer natural. Extreme weather events caused by more heat in our climate system are already increasing, putting a great toll on the public and our ability to recover. Well says, this is among the scariest features of rapid climate change. Not that it changes the everyday experience of the world, though it does that, and dramatically, but that it makes once unthinkable outlier events much more common and ushers whole new categories of disasters into the realm of the possible. Fresh water drain. Some regions will have more difficulty getting fresh water for drinking and agriculture. Those regions like Pakistan that are dependent on glacier ice will find that resource scares as ice melts. Even though we in Rochester region have plenty of fresh water now, we have many concerns about pollution and harmful algae growth in our lakes, which are fueled in part by warming waters. We will be hard pressed by others without water to divert waters from our Great Lakes, which could seriously alter our lake levels and even our local weather. When people are desperate for water, they will do anything to get it. Well says, as soon as 2030, global water demand is expected to outstrip supply by 40%. Dying oceans. The lion's share of our heat has been absorbed by our oceans, causing ocean currents to begin shifting fish populations to migrate away from their former ecosystems and the ocean's absorption of CO2 to rise, causing acidification. That has already presented a great challenge for coral reefs and shellfish. Well, it says, the oceans also maintain our planetary seasons through prehistoric currents like the Gulf Stream and modulate the temperature of the planet, absorbing much of the heat of the sun. Wells focuses on Several other potentially catastrophic scenarios like unbreathable air, economic turmoil, and cascading east ecosystem collapses. And I just wanted to highlight one of, one of them, climate conflict. That I think is crucial to understanding the full impact of this crisis. Much of our struggle to address climate change is not only dealing with the disturbed natural systems because of rap rapid change, but how humanity itself reacts to both the consequences and efforts to address them. Wells says, if climate change makes conflict only 3% more likely in a given country, that does not mean that it is a trivial effect. There are almost no 200 countries in the world, which multiplies the likelihood, meaning that the rise in temperature could yield three or four or six more wars. Various disaster scenarios are being played out now. Some are coming to, no matter what we do, and some hellish situations leap into the realm of the extreme the paranoid, but also the possible. 
Well says, and there are and there is already right now fully a third more carbon in the atmosphere than at any point in the last 800,000 years, perhaps in as long as 15 million years. There were no humans then. The oceans were more than 100 feet higher. Yet this book is not about hopelessness. It's about galvanizing the public by inserting a strong dose of fear, a fear that is justified. Fear, although although generally distasteful to the public, is a great motivator in Wells' opinion. For me, the most startling quote in this indict indictment of our lack of effort to address this crisis, Wells says, in fact, more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels has been admitted in just the past three decades. Let me repeat that. In fact, more than half of the carbon exhaled into the atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuel has emitted in, has been admitted in just the past three decades. That is to say, in the time since humanity has warned climate scientists that we must address by climate time that we must reduce our fossil fuel emissions to avert the worst consequences of this crisis. We have not only ignored the warning, we have proceeded with unprecedented ecological recklessness. Although much is already happening and will happening because we have squandered so much time, we can, in Wells' opinion, still make this climate crisis endurable if we act on a scale and a time frame that will matter. Wells says, the thing is, I'm optimistic. Given the prospect that humans could engineer a climate that is six or even eight degrees warmer over the course of the next central, several centuries, large swaths of the planet unlivable by any definition we use today, that degraded muddle counts for me as an encouraging future. Warming of three or 3.5 degrees could unleash suffering beyond anything that humans have ever experienced through many millennia of strain and strife and all out war. But it is not a fatalistic scenario. In fact, as a whole, a lot better than where we are headed. The unknown unknowns. I'm sorry, the known unknowns. There are lots of questions we can ask about what a warmer world will look like, but we, have, we may not look, have enough information to answer them. Will we try to geoengineer ourselves out of the warming and or succumb to the inevitable side effects? How much damage to our environment have we already inflicted that might make it less robust and resilient? I like to say in my writings, we will go into climate change with the environment we have, which I cannot deny is another very pithy Rumfeld quip. Wells says, will warming trigger rapid feedback loops forward powered by the release of Arctic methane or by the drastic slowdown of the ocean's circulation system? Well, the threats mentioned have a cascade effect, making addressing this crisis vastly more complex. In the last two sections of the book, Wells offers his insight on how we might get our heads around the enormity of this crisis, one that seems to be moving slowly, but is actually happening quite quickly. Part of addressing climate change will be trying to find out a good narrative to describe the situation we are in, for humanity has experienced nothing like baking a world with almost 8 billion people along with their critical infrastructure. Well describes several fictional works that attempt to explain possible future, but they all fail to grasp the murky uncertain world we are entering. Who's the villain? How do we make a narrative on complacency? One of the things that all of us need to get our heads around, including liberals, is that the blame for climate change does not exclusively lie with the Republican Party. In fact, that's a sort of narcissism. Well, it says the U.S. only accounts for 15 percent of the world's emissions and, in quotes, in the rest of the world where action on carbon is just as slow and resistant to real policy changes just as strong, denial is simply not a problem, unquote. I agree with most of what Wells says in his first two sections of the book, but in the last two sections, he moves away from a description of how climate change could impact our world and offers his speculation on how and why this came to be. Though I mostly agree with his speculations, I rather think it more important that the public understand the gravity of the first two sections. I, don't th I do not think it's a spoiler for the book by saying we humans are the solution. His arguments, as others have used, is that we should find hope in that humanity was powerful enough to have caused this climate change, so we should believe that we have the power to fix it. I do not 
agree with this position, as wrecking something is a lot easier than putting it back together. Well, it says, personally, I think climate change itself offers the most invigorating picture in that even its cruelty flatters our sense of power and in, do so, and in doing so calls the world as one to action. At least I hope it does. Note this statement of Wells's. Annihilation is only the very thin tail of a warming, very long bell curve, and there's nothing stopping us from steering clear of it, unquote. In my opinion, this says more about bell curves than it does about the actual problem of humanity's attempt to, attempt, attempt to address this crisis. In other words, what has and is, is stopping our ability to, to address climate change is ourselves. We have not really begun to shift our global energy needs from fossil fuels to renewable energy, nor have we figured out how the public will respond when draconian measures are asked of them to avoid disaster. Although the worldwide response to the pandemic is giving us some clues. As comprehensive as this book is about the challenges awaiting us on climate change, I found many important omissions. The role of the military, which provides most of the emergency large-scale disaster response around the world, and the role of the media, especially local media, climate change education in our schools, and the need for a dramatic increase in our ability to monitor, monitor our environment's health as we go further into this crisis. Criticisms of this book have ranged from those who think it's too pessimistic and many who think there are many factual errors to those who say Wells mostly got it right. I think Wells' position that how humanity reacts to climate, the climate crisis, its solutions, and its impact on our economy is key to exploring, evaluating, and accomplishing solutions. In my opinion, not enough attention has been focused on this point. How are we humans going to react? Wells' writing styles is what might be called clumsy and long-winded if it were not written by such a gifted writer. I found myself speeding through the long, vigorous sentences with exhilarating interest. This book is an important read, even if it is a tome that examines many great possible worst-case scenarios, but not getting a full picture of climate change, that is, understanding the implications of doing too little to address climate change, is a dangerous delusion. After the short review of Wells' book, you probably have a lot of questions. I hope so. I suggest that you read this book where Wells explains in much more detail many of the things I have only mentioned, annotated as I have been mentioned, with copious footnotes. Wells says, and here's, this is the final quote, no human has ever lived on a planet as hot as this one. It will get hotter. Time passes. <laughs>